Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar provided by BobWillisOnline.com. My name is Bob Willis and I'll be presenting today's webinar. Before we start talking about uh, cleaning and qualification of cleaning processes, I'd first like to introduce you to the control panel which you have on your screen at this moment in time. This allows you to do a number of things during the webinar. First of all, you can open and close the control panel, thus not obscuring your view of the slides during the presentation. You can make the image on your screen or on your projection facility in your conference room go full screen by clicking on the blue button. Now, if you'd like to ask a question at any time during the webinar, just type your question directly into the control panel, as indicated here by the red arrow. Sometimes it's better to ask a question during the session, although we'll be answering that at the end of the webinar this afternoon, but sometimes you remember a particular point that you would like to query. If you have any technical problems, please use one of the telephone numbers provided on your reminder emails. You'll also need your webinar ID number and access code, which was included on your emails. It's not possible for myself, the presenter, to assist you during a live presentation. At the end of the presentation, we have a few survey questions for you on the content of the webinar and topics you might like to hear about in the future. You'll also receive a copy of the presentation material as a PDF and we'll be sending those out shortly after the webinar ends this afternoon. Now a little bit about my background, I've been involved in electronic manufacturing all of my career, uh, originally with GEC Marconi where I was uh, looking after engineering quality, material evaluations, process evaluations and then I set up uh, a training business within a subcontractor prior to setting up my own training consultancy business which I've now run for over 25 years. That's just a little bit about me, my activities and what I do within the industry. Now today we're going to be talking about cleaning and qualification of processes and although there are standard techniques that are well used in the industry, I want to mention those but I also want to mention some of the more cost effective techniques and things you can do before you start spending a lot of money on setting up processes and evaluating them to international standards. Just as a reminder, we have webinars every month throughout the year and these are the webinars that are coming up uh, throughout the first couple of months of this year, 2017. Of course, we can run individual webinars for companies if you have a particular topic that you would like to hear. Just contact us via our website. Now, in terms of reference material within the industry, uh, there are a number of textbooks that have been around for some time um, and each of them still provides quite a lot of useful information on cleaning, evaluation, evaluation of components, design for cleaning, etc. However, the latest book, uh, Critical Cleaning, only really has one chapter specifically on cleaning of printed circuit boards and that was introduced in 2011. Of course, there are also IPC standards and IPC reference documents on cleaning and evaluation. Now I've illustrated them here and each of them cover some aspect of either the evaluation or testing techniques or the requirements of cleaning and the level of cleanliness within your process. So again, referencing some of these documents may be useful. Uh, particularly the latest version of the IPC 65 document specifically on cleaning of printed circuit boards. Now, the first thing you have to do when you're setting up any cleaning process is to determine that your chosen flux can be removed from the printed circuit board or on a test board uh, by your chosen cleaning chemistry. We don't have to worry about the efficiency or the performance of the cleaner to start off with. What we're interested in is, is the material soluble? Now, if the residues are soluble in your chosen cleaning chemistry, then it's going to make it a lot easier to remove from the printed circuit board. Equally, uh, it will speed up the process 
being the time taken to get to the level of cleanliness you require in your process. So basically what I tend to do or what I've done in the past on many occasions is taken some sample flux material and put it into a cleaning solution and looked for it to go truly into solution. Now any cleaning process in line or batch cleaning can remove flux residues, literally blow them off with the force of the solvent or water, forcing it off the surface of the board, but that's not really solubility, that's not real cleaning. So cleaning initially is dissolution, it's going into solution, and then we replace that with cleaner and cleaner levels of cleaning solution prior to the drying phase, and that is the true essence of cleaning. So what we want to happen is that the residues are removed from the circuit board, they go into solution, and we can then achieve higher levels of cleanliness after that particular point. So how do we achieve that? Well, simply we can clean and visually look, or we can do it a little bit more technical, but we don't want to spend too much money at this time. We just want to make sure we're doing what we're trying to achieve. And uh, one of the techniques is taking the flux material uh, of the solder paste you're using. And this is just an example where I've taken paste flux, which is specifically the same material as used within the flux. I've reflowed it, put it through a reflow cycle, and as you can see, um, the material has changed its, changed its state. It's also reduced the volume of material, the weight of material, which is present in these hourglasses. And then what I've done is I've placed a specific amount of material onto a glass plate, I've weighed it, and then I've attempted to clean it. So seeing that the material is A, being dissolved from the surface of the glass plate, plate and also we're seeing a decrease in the weight of the material left behind. So this is fairly simple, uh, easy to do and doesn't take a lot of time and of course doesn't cost you a lot of money. So by doing this we know whether the material is soluble or not soluble in your cleaning, cleaning process. Now before we go into the techniques uh, of setting up or evaluating a process, let's just briefly talk about the different types of cleaning system which are available to us. Well, first of all, the batch cleaning process, where we go through a cycle of cleaning boards, normally uh, in some form of basket, which is either manual or mechanical. Now, this can be in a uh, water-based cleaner, uh, but more commonly, this type of cleaner is a solvent-based system. And you need to check, obviously, that the solvent you're proposing to use is not going to be banned in the future or near future uh, for electronic assemblies. So we take our batch of boards, we put it into the, the boiling sump. Now, some people decide not to actually put it into the boiling sump because this obviously retains some of the previous residue from the cleaning process. And what they actually do is actually hold it above the boiling sump and allow that material or the vapor to condense on the surface of the board uh, to give it a cleaning cycle. Because as the solvent condenses on a surface, it will clean the residue. But there's no mechanical removal technique in this particular case. It's just uh, literally evaporation of the solvent drainage. If you were putting it into the boiling sump, as indicated here uh, by the red heater on this left-hand side of the diagram, uh, we would then lift it out and hold it in space, in air, to allow the condensing material from the solvent uh, to remove the excess material which is present from the initial cleaning stage. We would then move over the basket containing the printed circuit boards and either do a vapor clean or quite commonly put it into the distillate. Now basically what this is, is the solvent which has been evaporated uh, through filters and then that is pure solvent. So it doesn't have the flux residues because they've been taken out. The board or batch of boards will be held at this point. Now, generally speaking, the distillate material is at a much lower temperature. So you're not actually getting heat assisting us 
uh, during the cleaning fires. We would then lift the batch of boards out into free space where the solvent would again condense on the surface to give it its final cleaning rinse. So that's a, a normal solvent-based system but could be a water-based system. Now most water-based systems batch semi-aqueous processes are multi-stage, multi-tank. So in this particular example we show a wash tank, uh, three rinse tanks and finally a drying tank. And this may or may not be assisted with spray and that spray under, under the fluid or under immersion as it's referred to or using ultrasonics. So basically a batch of boards will be lowered into the cleaner which may be a 10%, a 50%, 100% solution and be held there for a period of time depending on what you found through your previous evaluations or the techniques we're going to be talking about a little bit later. And then the batch of boards would go into the second wash stage or the first rinse stage depending on how you set your process up. So it would remain again in here for a period of time as you've defined and then it would subsequently go through the next steps in the process before it goes into the drying phase. Now in this video I'll just show you an example of a batch cleaner and theoretically we've lowered the boards into the cleaner and what you can see here uh, based on my GoPro camera is spray under immersion. So basically we've got a mechanical method of removing or assisting the removal of any flux residues which are present on the printed circuit board. This type of system can also be used uh, using ultrasonic energy. So from those stages we would again progress through and then finally we would go into the drying stage and the boards will be held there for sufficient time to evaporate any of the remaining uh, moisture from the surface of the board. Typically the last stage in a batch cleaning process like this would be using distilled water. Um, this gives us the highest level of cleanliness uh, achievable. If you use just uh, tap water because of the variation that we see throughout uh, different parts of a country uh, you will potentially uh, suffer with issues of compatibility or inconsistency in cleaning performance. Now just as a, an explanation, spraying and spray in immersion or under immersion is what I show here in the illustration on the left hand side of the screen. So although the force of the jets is somewhat uh, compressed or decreased because you're spraying under immersion, it still does assist the cleaning process. Uh, in the second example on the right hand side, this is standard spray in air. So basically all of the force of the jets are spraying directly onto the board surface. And depending on the angle of the jets, the position, the distance, um, obviously it will affect the ease of which we can achieve clean printed circuit boards. These techniques are all available from different suppliers of different cleaning processes. Now there is one supplier who offers centrifugal cleaning and this has been used uh, for high-end cleaning where boards are placed into a rack then lowered into the machine and the machine is filled with a cleaning solution and then subsequent rinse solutions but the board is literally span around or the rack is span around. So what we're actually doing is spinning the boards backwards and forwards uh, to allow the solvent to penetrate underneath and around components and give us the cleanliness we desire. So this video clip just shows you an example of that type of process. So here you can see um, the rotation of the carrier with the boards present in it and then we can see the final uh, rinse and then the final drying cycle and then the board or the carrier will be taken out. Uh, on the second example 
on the right hand side you can see a standard inline cleaning process this is in fact one of my old inline solvent cleaning processes now one thing to bear in mind is that the mechanical force applied with a spray system can obviously affect very small boards it can lift uh, boards up and it can possibly damage very small boards. Generally, large boards are not a problem. In a central fugal system, you've got to bear in mind that if you've got a board with very, very heavy components like ceramic uh, chip carriers, uh, ceramic uh, column grid arrays, then that motion, that movement, that centrifugal force may deform some of the leads on the components. So we've got to consider that. It may not be an issue, but please consider it when you're evaluating these types of processes. So an inline cleaning process, uh, basically as its name suggests, we go through multiple cycles, wash, two washes possibly, a rinse or multiple rinses, and then blow off. And the blow off is there to remove any surface liquid from previous stages because you don't want to contaminate the next stage in the process and then final blow off before going through the drying stage an inline process as its name suggests is obviously controlled by the throughput speed of the conveyor and if you have a problem with the machine obviously you can't clean printed circuit boards if you want to change the process it has to be the same process parameters for each of the boards unless you wait and batch the boards together. There are again a few other tricks of the trade with inline cleaning and it can be very very effective both for solvent although very rarely used nowadays uh, but certainly uh, water wash and semi aqueous materials can be used. So we go through the washing stage, we go through the blow off stage and then rinsing stage and then finally into the drying stage. So I just show you another example and I've taken this from a Speedline video clip which shows uh, the energy being applied to the surface of the printed circuit board and the important thing here is the design of the system, the design of the jets to make sure the force is not just causing the liquid to bounce off the surface of the board, it's really forcing material underneath components to give the cleanliness you really want on your process. So it's understanding how the jets work and the energy is how it's being applied to the surface of the board. And being able to see what's going on is an important aspect of evaluating a process. Now, an inline process just like with a batch process, you can get different nozzle configurations and you'll hear lots of weird and wonderful names for the types of nozzles. Fundamentally, what we're trying to look at and understand is the efficiency of the nozzles, the bloom of the nozzle, this is the area of contact across the surface of the printed circuit board, and what sort of angle will improve the performance of the cleaning process. And you have to have something to be able to evaluate uh, to see which one of these cleaning processes or which set or which type of jets give the best performance. Now, one of the things that uh, people have done over the years is just looked at what actually happens when we try and clean a printed circuit board. And what I've done here is I've taken one of my old video clips just to illustrate if we uh, pour a liquid onto a surface, um, we can get a feel for the angle of attack. So here what we can see is at some point uh, when we're pouring a liquid onto a printed circuit board, it's actually flushing out underneath components. And at some point, at some angle, the liquid is not really flushing underneath the components. Now this has also been done uh, by other companies and in this illustration we can see a small piece of glass uh, with a very small gap and flux residues underneath and what has happened here a jet is being applied directly onto the glass and as you can see it's slowly removing the flux residues from underneath the glass so this is a process to understand what's actually going on during the cleaning phase 
and much of what I'm going to be talking about is different ways of achieving that so we can really see a visually first of all the performance of the cleaning process because there is absolutely uh, no value in spending a lot of money on more complicated tests unless you know you've actually achieved a fairly good level of cleanliness uh, with your simple techniques. So the batch cleaning process which has become very popular over the last few years as people have gone back to cleaning of printed circuit boards possibly uh, due to the increased use of conformal coating. So a batch process sometimes just referred to as a dishwasher because it really does look like a dishwasher. Uh, a dishwasher is uh, loaded with printed circuit boards in a frame or in a carrier and the important thing is the boards are mounted correctly, they're held in place, they will not move around, uh, lay on top of each other or damage each other during the cleaning cycle and depending on the machine you buy you may have one or two layers of boards and you may have multiple nozzles rotating nozzles or fixed nozzles within the process we would load the boards in we would close the door we would switch the system on and forget about it for a period of time but what we want to be able to do is understand when the flux residues are removed from the printed circuit board because ideally we want the shortest cycle time possible um, to not hold up the production process. So if you go for a cleaning cycle of an hour, then you may be restricted on your throughput because of it. If you can take 10 minutes off that, that's an advantage, 20 minutes or so on, then that's also an advantage in a medium volume production process. So we want to understand what's going on inside and some batch cleaning machine suppliers uh, have actually produced cleaners with glass fronts. You generally won't be able to purchase them. They're normally used for development of cleaning processes. Theoretically, you could. It would be quite expensive to purchase, but it is used as the development phase. So if we have a batch cleaner, um, here's just an example of how boards might be racked in a batch cleaning process. You can see nozzles top and bottom and you can also see a rotating wand at the top. Again, each different system can be configured for a specific requirement, but it's important to understand the structure of your cleaning machine. So just to give you an example, this is a cleaning cycle uh, for printed circuit boards when I was running a production process within an exhibition and we were cleaning boards and you can see the whole cycle. So you can see the time, the temperatures, the material I was using, etc. Now, again, it depends what you want. If you want a clean board, if you want a, a board which meets certain cleanliness requirements or test requirements, that's fine. You've got to decide on what you want, but also we've got to look at the cycle time. And if, there's, if we know that we're removing all the flux residues in four minutes rather than eight minutes, then we've got a four minutes saving. So again, it's understanding the process and what's actually being done. Now, stepping back for a moment, um, when we look at the materials we use for cleaning, uh, we want to make sure they're not going to affect or the time taken is not going to affect the visual appearance of the board or the component or the solder joint. And these are just three examples of the visual appearance or the change in visual appearance that can occur uh, when we've got certain materials that we're using in the process. Again, the chemistry suppliers will be able to provide you guidance on this. So we don't want to take the nice shiny uh, appearance off your solder joints and have a nice dull appearance just purely because of the cleaning chemistry we're using or the cleaning process that we're using. So understand the methodology which is being used. In addition, uh, if you are using, and this is uh, a couple of examples here, and I don't want to get people worried because I've been using ultrasonic cleaning for many, many, many years without any problems whatsoever. But the top 
two examples are examples of cleaning printed circuit boards for hours and hours and hours in an ultrasonic tank. You can see we've affected the solder joint, we've affected the component. This is not the cycle time of two or three minutes, but just as an example, so it, it is true that uh, if you've got enough cavitation, mechanical force, you can damage parts and damage uh, solder joints. The bottom two examples are using the incorrect ultrasonic energy within an ultrasonic cleaning. So using something that was designed for cleaning uh, uh, parts of metal cars. But same sort of effect, you can see the effect of cavitation mechanical force actually on solder joints. But again, this was the wrong frequency and again, a long cycle time which led to this. So standard ultrasonic cleaning uh, is very, very effective. Um, and also can give a very good performance without any concern about damage to parts. But I illustrate what can go wrong if you just don't follow the rules. So if we look at uh, different methods now of evaluating a process or evaluating a machine or a cleaner, etc. Over the years, surface insulation resistance testing has been used effectively. And basically what we're doing is we're measuring the resistance change um, either on the surface of a printed circuit board or underneath components. So on the left hand uh, image, you see two test patterns on a breakout section of a printed circuit board. And here the idea uh, with at Motorola uh, was to process boards, leave them no clean or clean them, and then test the uh, performance of the material uh, on test coupons if required. On the right hand side it's one of my old or one of my very first SIR test boards where we've got parallel conductors underneath different surface mount components uh, to look at uh, cleaning performance and efficiency. Extremely old board, very low technology and I don't think anything would have ever failed but you know that's another story. Now what we're trying to do when we look at cleanliness and using SIR is to see change in resistance and normally speaking uh, this will coincide with the formation of some form of dendrite. Now this illustration is just two tracks on a printed circuit board and if we put a droplet of deionized water, demineralized water on the surface and apply a voltage um, without any other effort you may well find some dendrites forming. And this, we're creating electroplating cell between two surfaces. So we'd see copper dendrites forming between the two tracks, and this is dependent on how much water or moisture layer is there, how much contamination, uh, the voltage, and the distance between those two surfaces. So this is a common demonstration that people uh, uh, show or illustrate. But this is the failure mode, which is most commonly seen on real printed circuit boards in real applications. Now this video clip I show you now is just one of many clips that have been produced over the years. I quite often show some of my own clips but I thought we'd use this Trace Laboratories clip on this occasion. And you can see the reaction taking place between two copper conductors and the dendrites forming across the surface. So it's dependent on contamination, the amount of moisture, the voltage applied, and the separation distance between the conductors. Now, another technique that uh, I used uh, sort of in the 80s to evaluate a cleaning process, and, and what I wanted to do was find out um, what was the efficiency, how, 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 what sort of standoff height could I actually clean under. So I used glass plates, um, this is in the 80s, for an inline cleaning process and batch cleaning. So we basically took bare printed circuit boards uh, with no tracking on as you see here. They have the solder resist applied and we had standoffs positioned underneath the glass. And the wire you see in these two examples basically held the glass in place. It also stopped it tilting. Um, we then injected flux underneath the glass 
and then we subjected the glass to a heating process to simulate the soldering process that the flux would have to go through. The boards were then allowed to cool and then were passed through the cleaning process. And by doing this, we could then judge uh, how much flux obviously was applied and how much was removed during uh, the cleaning process. It would also give us an illustration of if we change the parameters, the speed of the conveyor, the pressure, etc., of the process, how easy and how quickly the flux could be removed. Very simple, doesn't take a lot of time, and fairly inexpensive technique. And you're relying visually. In this particular case, the flux had a UV trace in, so it did give us another advantage um, if we were perhaps missed it optically, um, the UV may assist us, but uh, optically it was fairly clear. We also did the same thing with solder paste materials. And in this particular case, we took solder paste, a known volume, we placed it between two glass slides of a fixed standoff height, and then what we did is reflowed it. So we're exposing the flux residues to the same reflow cycle that would happen on a printed circuit board. And you can see here the solder is present underneath the glass. And you can see the flux residues are also visible under the glass. Now, the slight disadvantage of this particular technique is you're not losing some of the flux. You have got the maximum amount of flux or residues left behind underneath the glass. When you're reflow soldering, a lot of these materials um, are driven off during the reflow cycles. That's what actually ends up on the inside of your reflow oven. So you actually have got more residue left behind underneath these glass slides than you would typically have on a normal printed circuit board. But that's no bad thing. It just shows, again, the efficiency of your cleaning process. Again, you could do weight gain, weight loss. You could just rely on the visual appearance of the flux residue uh, being removed from underneath the glass of different standoff heights. Um, that would be, a f again, a very, very simple technique. Now, other companies have taken this step a stage further and have produced more advanced or more, or more uh, uh, robust fixtures. Uh, these examples I want to show you now uh, were designed and built by BA Systems and also used by Kaizen and other suppliers uh, to evaluate uh, cleaning and cleaning performance. So what we've got here is a, a large, like a wave solder palette, if you like, with glass with different standoff heights, as indicated by the one thou, the two thou, uh, which are marked, which you could put flux residues or solder paste residues underneath, clamp them in place, the glass is in place, and then run it through the cleaning process. Um, so in this, this little video clip, I just show you me removing the glass uh, from the test pallet. So you can see the studs there hold the glass in place on two sides, and the other four studs inserted into the fiberglass material of the carrier is what gives you the fixed standoff height for the glass. Again, very visual, very simple, and when you've made your fixture, it's fairly inexpensive to run the tests. Now, again, the same type of test can be conducted with area array packages if you want to use the actual package. The reason we say this is because we have found that when you've got uh, components with little solder joints on, they do affect the way in which the cleaner runs underneath the package. I would say, in all honesty, if you've got standoff heights of uh, six thou, thousandths of an inch and above, you really shouldn't have any problems whatsoever. And really, the BGAs of this sort of standoff, it, it's just not an issue at all. As you get below four thousandths of an inch and even smaller, then perhaps that might start to be a factor. But really, with today's technology, um, with even with fine pitch BGA, it should not be an issue. Now, in this particular example, this is one of my, again, test boards for a different customer. And basically, we'd put some different components on. And again, we repeated the experiment using the little glass slides, similar 
to what BA Systems had done. And these boards were made for me by uh, Merlin Circuits. As you can see, the configuration and then the glass would literally sit on the surface. On this, this is another board I was using at uh, Apex and Productronica a couple of years back when we were doing live demonstrations of cleaning and cleaning assessment. In this particular case, you can see the glass slide mounted over one of the BGA packages. And this particular case, we were using thin uh, foil to give a fixed standoff height. And if I go in a little closer, uh, you can see here where again, I was using just the wire to hold the glass in place to stop it moving away. So you could, you could change the standoff height uh, fairly easily and remove the glass for inspection. So again, you could put the flux underneath and reflow it, or you could c contaminate the glass first of all, and then mount it to the printed circuit board. It's, it's whichever way was the most appropriate. Or, as another alternative, um, you could literally print paste, obviously, onto the exposed pads, and then reflow underneath the glass. Again, you've got the same issue. Well, not issue, but you will always have more flux residues left because you haven't had the chance for it to vaporize off during reflow. But again, all that's doing is giving you more flux rather than less flux. And here's a sideways image of one of these boards after cleaning. And as you can see, it's, you know, there is no residues left behind. It's squeaky clean. And glass is quite a difficult uh, surface to get absolutely squeaky clean. Um, not that I know, but certainly my wife does when she's cleaning at home. Now, another technique which, uh, again, is quite popular in our industry, and uh, uh, many of the cleaning manufacturers use this technique. Simply, they build boards and take the components off to look at residues underneath. And in the case of uh, uh, Kaizen, uh, they put a score against it. So the amount of contamination left would relate to zero to 100%. And after a cleaning process or a particular chemistry is used, they would come up with some sort of evaluation number. Uh, again, it's something that you can always decide yourself. And here I've uh, removed a component from printed circuit board, obviously mechanically. Um, you can see there is still some residue left underneath where the chip capacitor was, but certainly it's a lot cleaner on the right-hand side, on the bottom of the page of this slide, as opposed to the left-hand side. Again, to me, it's, it's, it's fine. It's more representative, I guess, of the assembly process, um, but it's a lot more time-consuming to do um, than using uh, the glass plate trick. Again, another example, and this is really where I've taken components off after uh, testing and evaluation. And you can see a nice example here where we can actually see uh, some conductive residue left behind underneath the package. This was actually a return, a sample that was bought for uh, me to evaluate at uh, the cleaning and contamination testing center that I ran at Apex again a couple of years ago in California. But again, a good example of a real failure and clearly the residues underneath the component has impacted on the reliability of this particular circuit board. Now, a sli slightly different technique, which uh, the very first time I used this technique, I, I thought, this is great. This is really nice. Um, same basic principle. Uh, we're using glass plates. But in this particular case, um, uh, PBT has taken the concept a little further. And what you're looking at here is precision ceramic components that are mounted to glass with fixed standoff heights. And if we look at closer up, you can see here the ceramic, you can see the, uh, the resin, which is holding the little ceramic parts in place. So it's fixed position. And on the bottom of the slide here, you can see the glass, which is approximately four inches by four inches. So you've got lots and lots of little chip components extremely closely packed, which in reality wouldn't uh, on a normal assembly. And the idea here is that uh, you put uh, some flux material. So the gel flux from your particular um, solder paste supplier uh, on the top. And you would heat the plate up at an angle and allow the resin 
to run underneath the components by capillary action. And then you just go around the block of components, remove the excess, run that through your reflow process to simulate the temperature and the impact of air or nitrogen on the flux residues, allow them to cool, and then put them through the cleaning process. And the nice thing with this process is that uh, PBT have developed an algorithm to allow you to assess using AOI, automatic optical inspection, the amount of residues remaining. So you could obviously look at it manually yourself or let the machine take the strain, which is kind of nice. Uh, and these are sort of uh, some results of coverage underneath uh, the ceramic parts um, for a particular material, cleaning process, machine, etc. So I've used these glass plates uh, a few times and have found them you know, very useful. And again, you're getting more of a calibration, I guess, a, a physical calibration, a number uh, related to the cleaning performance. I still think the other techniques I've talked about work just as well, but this is a little bit more sexy. And if you use AOI as a method to assess the results, then again, you've got perhaps more traceability of the results with your process for different process parameters. Now, let's assume for a moment, we're going to step back and you want to be able to look at uh, printed circuit board assemblies after test or after they've been through some environmental testing. Now, again, you can do it fairly inexpensively to start off with to prove your process. Um, before you do the more elegant and more expensive tests. And sometimes I use this technique for failure analysis or I use it for evaluation of the cleaning performance of machine. And what you're looking at here is the back view of a printed circuit board, which I've ground just like I would grind uh, a solder joint in a microsection encapsulant. And what you're looking at is the back of the pads on a printed circuit board assembly. So literally, I've ground up through the board, and I'm now at the back of the pads. So what you're looking at is the back of the solder pads you've soldered components to. And by doing this, we can look for flux residues without removing the residues underneath the components. You're still destroying the board sample that you're evaluating, but you're not removing the components. So by doing that, we can look for residues. So you can see on the left-hand side, clear examples of flux residues left underneath the solder mask. So that's why they're green. So you can see the solder mask. And you can also see flux residues around the back of the copper pad, fairly, very obviously. And by just taking a needle or a pin, you can break off the resist, as I've done here on the left-hand side, and you can see the residues that are left behind. So doing that on a board that has been soldered and not cleaned, or doing that on a board which has been cleaned, uh, you'll be able to see the difference in the performance. But I also use this test if I know we've got corrosion or we've got a problem. So if we've taken boards and put them into environmental test, but possibly not under power or not under um, uh, special conditions, we just put them in an oven basically with some humidity. We can see the reaction just literally by doing the same grinding and inspection technique that I show here. So again, it takes a little bit more time. You've got to have an oven, um, but you don't have to have the sophisticated tools associated with surface insulation resistance, which of course is probably the best technique, but there's no point in spending money and effort unless your process is pretty much there, or pretty much 95% effective. Now, I mentioned the use of UV trace in residues or flux residues, and I have used this a couple of times, and this is just an example of the Indium Corporation's test board for solder paste. And on this particular case, what we've done is printed and reflowed uh, a particular material which has got a UV trace in. So you can see here under UV light all the flux residues uh, that have spread out 
from the pads after the soldering operation but have not been cleaned. And we use this test board with the AOI inspection system, which was looking for UV, uh, to be able to look at the performance of cleaning. So again, all we need to do is put it in the cleaner. Was the board clean afterwards? Was there any evidence of residues seen uh, using uh, AOI? Again, another simple technique uh, to evaluate a process, provided you can get a paste which has got a UV trace in it, and it's obviously the paste that you're actually using in production, because that's what you want to assess, not a material uh, with a UV trace in that you're not actually going to use. Just a close up um, of the same board with residues after cleaning, and not very well, I may add, and it under UV light, just to show exactly the same thing. Now, not necessarily associated with uh, cleaning per se, but cleaning and drying. And I was amazed when I saw this for the very first time, and I don't profess to have dreamed it up myself, but I actually saw some engineers doing this. And what they were interested in is, after a cleaning, how much moisture or how much water or water droplets are trapped underneath components. So what they did is they took some blotting paper, put it on a bench at the end of the cleaning process and took their boards and banged them onto the surface of the blotting paper. And what you could see is any water and water droplets coming out from underneath components. Now, of course, they probably were scrap boards. Um, it's quite a severe test, but it worked very surprisingly well. So you can actually see the difference in drying cycle, temperature, um, force being applied. It's not what I perhaps would choose to do, but certainly it's crude, it's simple, and if you're not worried about the boards, it works. So that's just something that uh, is, is a way of assessing any moisture still left underneath the components on a printed circuit board. You can obviously do weight gain, weight loss, um, but you do need a very sophisticated set of balances, probably slightly more sophisticated than I'm showing in this illustration. Um, and you'd weigh the boards before and after the cleaning process, or you'd look at them before and just after drying processes. So a technique that you could consider. Now, there are some test tools or test fluids which are available, and Zestron have a flux and resin test kit. And basically, you apply material to the surface of joints and around the joints, and this illustrates whether there's any reactive materials still present on the printed circuit board. So you can see me applying the liquid on the left-hand photograph on the top row, and you can see the reaction either to the flux residues or the resin residues left on the samples here. And we've also done this experiment on a recent uh, exhibition in Sweden using this particular technique, um, and those results are available from Zestron if you're interested. And just a close up, and this video clip just shows me applying liquid to some joints and doing exactly the same thing again over here. Uh, but if you look at the two examples, um, you just got to be very careful that the material stays in place and doesn't capillary underneath the component. So in the example on the left hand side, uh, the material stayed in place and we leave it there for a period of time as defined by the supplier. But on the right hand side, you can see the material is capillary underneath the component. So clearly there wouldn't be enough time to react to actually show a positive or negative result on the board assembly. So again, if you are using this technique, follow the instructions, make sure the fluid is in contact for the full period of time required for the test. Again, something that uh, is fairly crude, um, but I've used this many, many times. This is the water break test. And this is a way of seeing contamination which is present on the surface. And uh, I've got two examples here of just copper sheet. And it's a way that I use uh, to evaluate if something has contaminated the copper. So in the case of the one on the right hand side, I'm looking at the impact of masking tape. So if I'm using masking tape on a board, 
a board that's going to be conformally coated uh, or needs to be cleaned, what I want is a tape which leaves the minimum residues, but equally I want to be able to clean it. So if I clean um, copper sample sheets like this, um, after putting material on, then after cleaning, I've got a feel for the cleanliness. In both of these examples, you can see the water de-wetting from the copper. What should happen is the water should stay perfectly in place where there's no contamination. So you should have a complete, uh, consistent fill. Now on to perhaps the more traditional methods. I, I've highlighted to you a number of techniques that you can use uh, to see contamination. And the next two techniques are really the ones that are used in the industry, um, but it still costs you money to do this, unless you have the equipment yourself. Um, but the first thing is finding out whether the process is working, optimum first, the times you're taking, etc., before you start measuring. So the traditional cleanliness monitoring is to take a printed circuit board assembly and put it into a system. Uh, where the bath itself is loaded with a 75%, 25% alcohol demineralized water solution or a 50-50, which is 50% uh, isopropyl alcohol and 50% demineralized water, and then measure the change in resistivity or conductivity of the test cell. So basically, we've got a sample board. It's put into a container with the material and we're checking to see the change in resistivity or conductivity. Um, and this is a standard test which has been around for a long, long time. One of the disadvantages of this test is that if there's nothing to measure, then you get a, a positive result. And there are quite a lot of flux residues today and flux systems in the marketplace which don't have any ionic species or certainly don't have any ionic species after reflow soldering. So you can actually get a clean result directly after reflow without any cleaning. Um, so you need to know the chemistry material being used and is this machinery going to be able to detect it. The other reason this particular type of process is used really is for process control rather than a final arbitrary number which is makes it good or bad it's a process control tool it measures differences and this is how we used to use it in uh, telecoms industry uh, we would use it for a number of different uh, 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 processes within our plant but it was really controlling the process highlighting there was a particular problem or potentially a particular problem as opposed to uh, saying that it would be the product would be reliable or not reliable now, the results that you get from this type of equipment, which is available from a number of different suppliers, um, are graphs similar to this. You might just get a final result, but you might equally be able to download all the data points, which I show here. And as you can see in this, we've either taken a short test cycle or a longer test cycle, and we've got the residues coming off the printed circuit board, but they're, again, all below um, the number specified in IPC and other documents. If you allow the test to be conducted for a much longer period of time, you might actually go over that limit, but you've got a question, is that flux residues or something being drawn out from the surface of the board or drawn out from the components themselves? Now, you've already seen me use the glass plates on a printed circuit board. And I've also used this in reverse. So basically, I've used this technique to look at the performance of the contamination testing equipment. So in this particular case, uh, I've used the same technique, glass plates, and I've introduced a known level of contamination. And I've used, uh, in the past, the test solution used to calibrate the machine. So if I put four droplets of contamination test solution, which represents 10 micrograms per centimeter squared. If I then put that into the chamber, go through the cycle, and I come out with uh, a number um, which is close to what I've added, then it shows that the machine is removing all the contamination from the samples. Uh, 
If it comes out with a number much lower than what I've actually put into the system, then that's a problem. If it comes out with a number twice the size, I should have cleaned my hands and the board first of all. Now, obviously people are becoming more and more concerned and taking greater and greater care over assessment. And iron chromatography is the latest technique or technique that uh, is being more commonly used on printed circuit board assemblies in the automotive industry and in certain other industries. But again, it can be an expensive technique, but it can be done by a laboratory for you. And the other nice thing is we can do selective testing. Here on the bottom right is one of my test boards or one of my training boards. And my good friends at um, Rockwell Collins, what they did is mounted some little uh, uh, metal shields around selected components, which allowed us to put test solution just around that component or those components, and then measure the local contamination. And what we're actually then being able to do is look at the specific species of ionic residues and non-ionic residues, uh, which may contribute to an issue. So basically what I've shown you here is, a, is part of a chart which comes out of one of the IPC standard test methods, and it gives some level of contamination for different uh, bromide, chloride, fluoride, sulfate, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, there's specific numbers there allowing you to test boards for specific contamination rather than an overall contamination. Uh, and again, if you refer to the standards, there's more information specifically on this particular test. But it's really a laboratory-based test, not a production test. SIR, surface insulation resistance. Now, I mentioned this right at the very start, and I was not trying to put you off doing testing like this because it is really one of the best tests. It is more representative of a production process than the reliability of a product. But again, it takes time, and it can be expensive to do. So you must make sure your process is right. Rather than just randomly producing some samples and have them tested, um, then do the engineering first, and then you'll hopefully get very, very successful results, or it will show you where you can improve. Now, basically, the printed circuit board on the bottom right here is a qualification board used for qualifying different parts of the process. And underneath a lot of the components on the board is an SIR, surface insulation resistance test pattern. So it allows us to put this through the assembly process and then monitor changes in resistance directly on a printed circuit board when subjected to temperature and humidity, which is a requirement on a lot of standards today. So this is a close-up view of one SIR test pattern. This is a very old test pattern, or it's a test pattern used really for solder resists and uh, solder paste materials. Um, but it's one of the, you know, the original test coupons that was used in the industry. But now, more and more people want to use things that are representative of the assembly process. So this is a SIR test pattern. What I've done here is I've just highlighted on this B52 test pattern where the different test points are and what styles of components. And the nice thing about the test pattern is you can use this and modify it yourself to add in different components that you want to test. So this is the actual board, and here you can see the SIR test patterns underneath selected components. And these are the parameters uh, which are typically used and highlighted in one of the IPC standards. You can adjust these, you can modify them um, to suit with discussion with the customer, but these are sort of typical uh, the the uh, parameters used during SIR testing. And I'm not going to go through these because you really uh, should review this with the standards and your requirements, but it just gives you an illustration. And the boards basically are taken after processing and then put into a chamber. And what you're looking at here is direct measurements on those patterns 
when they enter the chamber and over a period of time. So basically, initially, when you put a board like this into high humidity, the resistance value drops quite quickly. And then it recovers, as you can see with each one of these traces. And the basic failure is anything, you look for something below uh, eight and below, but anything that you see here would be perfectly acceptable. You can see it's recovered and the original samples have recovered. You'd also look visually on the samples for any forms of corrosion on the printed circuit board. Now, this is a modified version of what I've previously shown you. This is the uh, B52 board, which I just recently uh, modified for a event we were running in Sweden. And we've added in some very small chip components. And we've also added in QFN, LGAs. So there are four on this board. And this is the assembled version of the board. And what we've done here is produced an SIR test pattern between the individual pads of the QFN. So these QFNs were assembled with solder paste and reflowed. In our experiment, we were using uh, vapor phase reflow as opposed to convection because that was the experiment we were doing. And as you can see here, we've got some with the uh, vias underneath and some without vias underneath. And we're just experimenting to see the result. So if we just look at an example of results, and this is just taken from one particular board on one of the uh, studies we were doing. You can see here there certainly are one, two, and three traces on the printed circuit boards which have dropped dramatically and stayed low. Um, they're obviously intermittent, which indicates that probably some dendrites have formed on certain locations, and this is why you're seeing um, this uh, very uneven pattern. So you would then look at those three examples either at the end of the test or prior to the end of the test uh, to see if you could see any corrosion deposits. But this is typically what you would see. Uh, we've also used this technique at MPL um, for our new saturation test, which is a condensation uh, in that we want condensation to form on a printed circuit board. And the test is there as an alternative uh, to the droplet test, which is used by some automotive manufacturers, because we believe that uh, this will be a much better test because we can control the amount of moisture forming on a surface rather than the random droplets that can form uh, with the dew point test. So that's an example of the use of surface insulation resistance. Now, just to kind of conclude, um, I've been running the MPL Cleaning and Contamination Testing Center over a couple of years at different locations. And we've got or had a lot of results based on that and the quite a few technical papers also available. So if you're interested in any of the reports that we've produced after doing these these events live uh, at exhibitions, we'll be able to provide these for you and for your reference as well. Um, in addition, I thought I'd just mention my two books, which are available, uh, Package on Packaging and uh, Reflow, Through-Hole Reflow Assembly or Pin and Paste Reflow. Again, both available to download if it's something you're interested in. When you get a copy of the slides, you can use the links and download these books. They're all free of charge. And a reminder, once again, um, our sessions, they come up every month. Um, and of course, you can book specific topics, different topics for your engineering team if you would like to do that. So we got to the point of um, the session where are there any questions? So all you need to do if you have a question that you haven't already submitted it, um, just type it directly into the control panel and we'll do our best to answer the question for you. Uh, so I'm just going to take a couple of moments. I'm just going to read the questions that have come in so far. But if you have any questions, just type them directly into the control panel, and I'll do my best to answer them for you. OK. 
Okay, first question. Uh, can you use these techniques for no clean and cleanable fluxes? Um, yes, you can, uh, I would say. Um, you will obviously, with a no clean product, you would tend to have much less flux residue uh, to assess. Um, but just like with any flux material, visually you should be able to see some evidence after the reflow cycle. So you should be able to use any of the test techniques that I've shown. I've certainly used it on no clean solder paste many, many times. But remember what I said is that if it's sandwiched between a glass plate or a glass plate and a printed circuit board, there will be more residue there than you would normally typically expect on a real printed circuit board. But as I suggested, that if you can show how easy it is and how quickly it is to clean, um, that's an advantage because you're showing your machine is more efficient than perhaps it actually needs to be. Is there any disadvantage with different uh, methods of cleaning, i.e. water soluble or semi-aqueous? Personally, I don't believe there is really any difference in terms of using the techniques to assess the processes. Um, the different chemistry you're using is all about the flux you're trying to remove. And by changing the chemistry slightly um, or increasing the, uh, the percentage of chemistry used in the cleaning process will enhance the cleaning efficiency, um, but you don't want to use too much because it's costing you money. Uh, I haven't mentioned about the financial side of, uh, 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 in this particular evaluation, apart from the testing techniques. I've said to you that if you use the, the Rolls-Royce test methods, SIR right at the start, and you don't have a control process, that's going to cost you a lot of money. You might be lucky and get the results straight away, but generally speaking, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Get the process right, then do the, the more accepted tests on your printed circuit boards. Um, in terms of you know the types of fluxes and combination of uh, cleaning materials, please talk to the suppliers. Um, I've mentioned a couple. There are many suppliers in the industry, but um, the, the couple of companies that I've mentioned have extensive evaluation facilities in different parts of the world, and they have extensive library of results of different chemistries, different percentages, temperatures, etc., for different flux and paste residues. So utilize their experience, work with them to get as close as you possibly can to the right parameters before you actually start cleaning a board. Or alternatively, go to those suppliers with boards, tell them in advance what you want to do, and they will help you set up one of their demo facilities uh, to clean boards. And I would suggest uh, get a ver very, very close uh, to the results that you want to achieve, but in your own process. Next question. In your uh, presentation, you haven't talked about compatibility of components and PCB surface finishes. No, that's, that's fine. I haven't, because really that's a sort of separate issue. Um, evaluating components for cleaning is something that needs to be done prior to the design cycle. Uh, it can't be addressed during the assessment of the product for cleanliness. The reason being, quite simply, it's too late then. Um, so any designer should be checking components are compatible, uh, compatible with different cleaning processes, and if they are looking at alternative suppliers, as they obviously should do, but minimize the number of alternative suppliers, um, they should be finding out whether components are acceptable or not, and also getting confirmation from the supplier. I personally never rely on a supplier saying they're okay. I still like to test. But either way, do both. Get confirmation they say it's okay, test it yourself, and then you get confirmation what they've said and told you is in fact correct. So just give it a couple of more uh, moments uh, to see if there's any more questions coming in on our webinar today. OK, 
Okay, well that looks like uh, there are no other questions coming in at this moment in time. So I'd like to thank you all for attending this webinar this afternoon. I hope you found it useful. I hope you found it entertaining, uh, simple, straightforward. And I hope that some of the techniques, some of the simple techniques I've shown you will allow you to do the initial setup on your machines to get the best performance, the fastest cleaning, the most efficient process before you move on to the next stage of your evaluation. Good afternoon to you all.